story Gary was telling there about his mom and when when his stepdad that died, her being it reminds me of that joke. Bill Keener knows this one about the man that died and went to heaven and he got up there and Peter's Peter asked him to watch the gate. He had he had something to do and he said when when people come up here, just tell them to spell, to spell the word love, and if they can spell the word love, they can get in. So guy took over there and was watching the gate. A couple people died and come up there, and he was like, just spell the word love, and they spell it, and he let them in. Well, his wife died, and he seen her coming, and she got up there, and she's like, man, this place is beautiful. And he was like, yeah, and he said, he said I'm watching the gate, and he said, there's one thing you got to do in order to get into this place. And she said, what's that? He said, you got to spell Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so it, the reason I bring that up is my, my, my grandfather, my grandfather, my dad's dad, they broke the mold with James Lucas. Uh, James Lucas was a, I, I'm not just saying this because he was my grandpa. He was, a, he, was a, he was a good man. I found out after he died just all the things that he actually did do for people that nobody ever knew about, but Loved the Lord, and it, my grandma, my grandma worked him in, into four ma major heart, heart attacks. Just never happy, you know. Just bathroom on this side of the house. Now I want it on this side of the house, and he just just worked himself to death for her. He was loading up lumber one time at a at a at a lumber yard and started having a major heart attack. And because he didn't want her to know, he drove her all the way home like 35 minutes. And then drove himself back to the hospital. And by the time he was there, they had to fly him to Charleston. But he ended up dying about three or four years before her. And then she got ate up with cancer. And at, at her funeral, at her funeral, uh, one of my uncles, which would have been her son, was like, can you imagine what Grandpa thought when he saw her coming? And Joe said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> but at least he got a little bit of rest, Bill, before she got there, you know. But both of them were saved. My, my dad's, both my dad's parents were saved, and uh, those I, I watched them both leave the world, leave this world, and they both left with with just peace and assurance. And, and I'm thankful that I, I know I get to see them again. And my my both of my other grandparents are saved too. My mom's dad's already died, and. My, my other grandmother isn't doing good, but you know, but all four grandparents and a, and a dad and a mom that you know are going to heaven with you, and your only brother, all saved. Man, that's that's a blessing right there. It's a yeah. blessing. Yeah. But Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one. We're going to start looking at this prayer of the Apostle Paul here in verse 15 through 23. And last week we had looked at the purpose of God concerning the mystery of his will that he has now made known unto us. <clears throat> you know, that's the first section of Ephesians. And so we had, we had from verse 3 that the verse 14 is the purpose of God. And the, this purpose of God that he's now made known, if you look there in verse, verse 9, having made known unto us, what? The mystery of his will. According to what? Is this the good pleasure? Is that what he says? According to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. And so... Paul has now, in those verses, explained to us this purpose of God concerning the mystery of his will and how, how you and I have been chosen by God in Christ before the foundation of the world for this purpose concerning the mystery of his will. And now Paul's prayer, <coughs> we'll do it like this, from verse 15 down to 23 you have Paul's prayer for our understanding of that purpose, right? And so, and so <clears throat> this morning we're going to look at this prayer. We're going to start looking at it. We ain't going to get through it all. 
But this is Paul's prayer for those who have trusted in Christ. If you, if you go back to verse 13, let's start in verse 13. Paul said, in whom ye also trusted, when? After. I hear so many people talk about their salvation experiences, man, and it's just, just mind-blowing. Well, I stopped on the side of the road, and I saw the most beautiful sunset. And I just knew that God saved me. I've heard it. Y'all laugh. I've heard it. I'm, are you saved? Yeah. How, how'd you get saved? Well, I went up to the altar and just prayed till I got through. Come on. You know what that is? That's a self-deceived, hell-bound sinner. Amen. In whom you also trusted when? After. After that ye heard the word of truth. What is the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. <clears throat> the good news. The word of God. What we heard was God's word of our own salvation. And when we heard, after we heard that, we trusted in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now look at what he says. In whom also, get the word, after, see we're getting an order of events here. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> Can a believer who has met the qualifications of trusting Christ after hearing the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, in whom also after they, that they believed they were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, can a man hear that gospel, trust in it, and then get out, get out of Christ? Absolutely not. Not a chance in this world. You know why he can't? Because God cannot lie. That's it. Because look at what seals him. Guys, we ain't talking about a feeling. Yeah. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about this this morning. Right? God, reality is not subject to how you feel today. Yeah. And thank God for that. Yeah. <coughs> right? <laughs> reality is reality regardless of how you feel about it. But in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of what? Promise. You got it. You're holding it. You're holding it. Why, why come down here and saying, God, just give me assurance. Coming down here, God, just tell me I'm saved. You got the Holy Spirit of promise in your hands. Amen. You believe it or don't you? A God that cannot lie put in writing a promise to you. That's the Holy Spirit of promise you're holding in your hand. Amen. And whom ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our what? That's verse 11. In whom also we've obtained an inheritance, right? And after we believed, we were taken and sealed in Christ with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Verse 15, wherefore? You see it? I also, since I heard of what? Your faith. Your faith. So, you had these people that had heard the gospel out here. They had heard, trusted, and were now sealed in Christ <coughs> under this redemption of the purchased possession out here. 
the Apostle Paul, upon hearing of these believers and how they had trusted in Christ, and of their love to the saints, he ceased not to give thanks for them and to make mention of them in, their, in his prayers. Verse 17 through 23 is his prayer. And listen, man, don't, don't get mad at me this morning, guys. We are so carnal in our prayer lives, and ain't even funny. <clears throat> we don't know how to pray. The only way you're going to be able to pray, what intercedes for you? How does he intercede? With groanings which cannot be uttered. That's you. The intercession of the Spirit is right there. He intercedes in that book in accordance to the will of God because you don't know how to pray. Amen. Amen. I mean, if you, I mean, I, I would, it would blow my mind one day if we'd say, uh, any prayer request, somebody would say, I just pray God give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. I pray, that this, I pray that God, according to the rich of his glory, would strengthen my inner man, that Christ may dwell in my heart by faith, that I could be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend the height, breadth, depth, and length, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. That's prayer. That's prayer. Amen? There ain't a thing we can do about the sufferings of this present time, guys. They're here. Something's going to get you. Something's going to get you eventually. <clears throat> God ain't going to get rid of all of it. You know, you know what happens to all men? Time and chance. Time and chance happeneth to them all. Birth, death, war, peace. Time and chance. Flat tires, car wrecks, cancer, cirrhosis. It happens to all of us. Amen? Paul was praying about something much deeper here. And his prayer, his prayer for these ones who had now believed is for them to have wisdom and revelation in this knowledge here and the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened for them to know some things. So the prayer Paul has for these believers now is for them to, be, to understand and to know the purpose and will of God behind their calling and redemption. You following that? God wants you to know. God wants to share with you. And this is, this is the privilege of being a son. Because what you were predestinated to is adoption. And this is one of the privileges of being a son. Is we get access to the mind and will of God like no other creature in heaven and earth. Did the princes of this world know what you know? No, they didn't. You have been called as a son to be, to, to be in Christ and, and one with him, access to, to the Father so that we can understand the will and purpose of Almighty God. We are being taught what God purposed in himself before the foundation of the world. And as a son, you've not only been given access to know what God purposed before the foundation of the world, but he's made you an heir according to that purpose so that you as a son can labor with him in bringing about his will and purpose in creation. Now that's a calling. I say it all the time. Paul called it a high calling. He called it a holy calling. Amen? Amen? And it's worth our time and it's worth our energy. What Paul's going to tell you in chapter 4 is to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. But first, before you can walk worthy of it, Paul gives you this purpose and plan of God and then he prays for you to understand it, to know it, to be enlightened to it. Right? And so we've been... Blood was shed, price was paid, the calling took place, we heard, trusted, and believed, and were sealed by God's promise in this redemption, and we are now awaiting this redemption of the purchased possession out here, 
And what Paul wants you to do is to understand what all this is about, what you've been called into. Right? Look at the prayer there in 117. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? The Father of glory. So, I know we don't, we don't think about stuff like this. The old, the, old Bible, the old Bible men, the old timers understood it. They understood that God has a name, but he has many titles. Jehovah is his name. Amen? But he has many titles. God, Father, Lord God Almighty, Lord of hosts, right? He has many titles in that book. Now this prayer here is addressed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? We'll come to chapter 3. Guys, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get to a point in your Christian life, man. I had to. We all do. You're going to have to get a point to a point in your Christian life where you understand there's not a piece of paper or ink wasted in that book. Every word is there for a purpose. Every word is pure. Add thou not, subtract not from it. This is a principle running clear through from Deuteronomy. Thou shalt not add unto or diminish up. Add thou not to his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a what? A liar. His words are pure. Every English word in that King James Bible is pure and it cannot be improved. And when you start messing with it, you're losing something. Now the prayer in 117 was to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who does Paul bow his knees to in Ephesians 3.14? For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now they're the same person. Two titles. Now do y'all believe that's important? Do you believe people who only know God as God have the same relationship as those who are his sons and he's their father? You following this? There's a reason Paul addresses these prayers the way he does. How did the book of Ephesians begin? Look at Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be who? God and the God and Father. And now you think it's just a coincidence that there's two prayers. And the first one is to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the second one is to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of y'all believe there's a reason for this? This is what real Bible study will, 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 will give to you. When you quit trying to rush through it and you decide, hey, I may be in Ephesians for the next year. But man, I'm going to stare at it. And I'm going I'm to unle- dig out all of its treasures. Right? Because the first prayer is to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a reason for that. Come to Colossians chapter 1. Now, y'all, y'all know what Colossians 2, 2 says, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, right? Let me ask y'all something. Had the Colossian believers ever met Paul? Never met him. Well, why is Paul talking about the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, a bunch of people he's never met? And how many of y'all believe prior to making that statement in chapter 2 that Paul somewhere in chapter 1 must have already given them enough to understand that there's a mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ? Well, look at 115. Who is the image of the invisible who? The firstborn of every what? See the colon? They're colon at the end of verse 15. So what's Paul getting ready to do? He's getting ready to explain something to you. For by him were all things created. Now do you know the mystery of God? 
Do you know why he did what he did in Genesis 1-1? Because I do. <clears throat> he didn't create it for Trump. And he didn't create it for, for Jinping or, or, or the Ayatollahs or anybody. You want to know the mystery of God in creation. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, both visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. So you want to know the mystery of creation? God created it all for his son. The firstborn of every creature. So the mystery of God in creation was that he was creating all these things for his son. That's the mystery of the father. Christ came into this world, didn't he? Came down into the creation. Died on a cross. Ascended back to God. God said, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. All right? You know what Christ is right now? Christ is God's son setting up there at the right hand of the Father. And you know what he is? God set him up there and hath put all things under his feet. Right? But now look at, look at Colossians 1.17. He is before all things and by him all things consist. Right? Is there a period? You're going to have to learn to read that book, man. There's a period there, isn't there? How's verse 18 begin? And. Same or different subject? Don't and mean in addition? So we're no longer dealing with Christ as the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature. We're dealing with something else. And he is the what? Head of the body of the church. Is there a colon? <laughs> Glory to God. If y'all if y'all would see it, you'd be ready to turn flip-flops, cartwheels, John Loudon would hop two inches, something. <laughs> I love you, brother John. <laughs> But who is what? The beginning, the firstborn from the what? Now back in verse 17, by him all things consist. But in 118 he says that in all things he might have the what? How? To the body. You getting this? And so what you end up with now, if you come into Colossians chapter 2, Paul tells you, that he has a conflict. He has a burden. <clears throat> Look at 2.1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them that are at Laodicea, and for as many as have not what? Seen my face in the flesh. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto the, unto the riches, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of what? The mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Listen, man, that's all that's going to last. There's no other wisdom in operation in creation right now that's going to be here. 5,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, every institution, every religion, every, every economy, government, everything will be gone. It all comes to nothing. There is no wisdom, nor counsel, nor understanding against the Lord. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
And you know what God did in his wisdom? You know what he did in his wisdom? It pleased him by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. And you know what he did when he did that? He didn't call the noble. He didn't call the mighty. He didn't call the rich. You know what he called? He called the foolish things of this world. To do what? Confound the things that are wise. You see your calling. That's your calling. You've been called to bring to naught the things that now are. They won't be here in 6,000 years, but you will. And you've been called out of this world to no longer function in the wisdom of this world. You've been called to operate and function in the wisdom that God ordained before the world unto our glory. You've got to learn it. You've got to understand it. You've got to be taught it. Amen. This is why Paul prays. This mystery of God, the mystery of the Father and the mystery the mystery of God concerns what he created all things for. We're here. You can see it. The invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. He created it all. Why? Why? It's a good question. Because if my Bible's right in Genesis 1-1, I don't only know my origin, but I also know and understand that if Genesis 1-1 is true, there was an intent and a purpose behind our origin. That's the difference between me and an atheist and an evolutionist. Evolution, evolution is just a bundle of cells wandering around lost and in darkness. In vanity. Amen? Eat, drink, tomorrow you die. But see, I understand because I believe that God is the creator of all things, that there is intent and purpose behind why we're here. And the Bible, you know what the first statement in the Bible is? In the beginning. You know what Paul just told you in Ephesians 1.10? Concerning the mystery of God's will is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. You know where time's moving? Listen, guys, time is moving forward with or without you. You can't stop it. And what I'm here to tell you is God set time in motion in Genesis 1-1 and He's got creation moving towards His intentions and His purposes and everything else is going to come to nothing. Most of what you know has happened in time was irrelevant. It came to pass in the process of time that Michael Jordan won six championships well, what they do? Right. Trump, FDR, Reagan, the American Revolution, Civil War, Emancipation Proclamation, a tale of the Hun, Genghis Khan, all irrelevant. No man can find the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. God set it in motion, and it's going somewhere. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen? That's what we talk about, the mystery of God. What was his intention and purpose behind creation? The mystery of the Father concerns Jesus Christ, his Son, manifest in the flesh, dying on a cross, raising up and ascending back up here. The gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. Amen. You know who God's Son is? He's the Lord of heaven and earth. God has set Him so. God set Him there and put all things under His feet. 
And he is the firstborn of everything God made. Amen. Amen, boys. You know what? When somebody goes against him, when somebody goes against Jesus Christ, you better go against that man. Amen. Look at uh, the mystery of Christ, though. This, this is where we're getting to. God created all things for his son. Jesus Christ came and is now set down as the heir of all these things, and all things have been put under his feet. But here's the mystery of Christ. You ready for the mystery of Christ? Before God created all things, He had already purposed in himself back here and chose you in Christ before he created all things and predestinated you to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. The mystery of Christ, you know what the mystery of Christ is? Man, it's massive. The mystery of Christ is that Jesus Christ's body is him and millions upon millions of Jews and Gentiles that have been reconciled to God by his blood, been redeemed and called out of this world to participate in God's plan and purpose for his creation as his sons and heirs with Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul's going to talk about this in chapter 2. And you, who were dead in trespasses and sins, hath he quickened together with Christ, raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show. Amen? But why? Why are you seated up there? You're seated up there. Look at Ephesians 1.10. We're going to get to this prayer just for a moment. That's why I said we weren't going to get to all of it this morning. But look in Ephesians 1.10. you got to get it again. <clears throat> Ephesians 1.10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together and want all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now that concerns heaven and earth. Verse 11, he says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to what? The purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You've obtained an inheritance in Christ, having been predestinated back here according to God's purpose for everything that he made. And so so I want you to get it, man. I want you to get it. When you were called by the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you were called and trusted and sealed by God, you were redeemed, that's verse 7, in whom we have redemption, verse 11, in whom we've obtained an inheritance, verse 13, in whom you trusted, verse 13, in whom also ye are sealed. And so what I want you to understand is this, is that when you were called by the gospel and sealed in Jesus Christ, It is so that you can become a part of this new man that's being created up here. And you as a son, I don't care about people out there. I don't agree with sonship edification. Don't don't agree with, I don't care. People are always looking for loopholes to get out of something. I don't care what you call it. Are you a son? Were you predestinated to adoption? Have you obtained an inheritance having been predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will? So then why do you think you're going up here? Can you figure that stuff out or can't you? You're going up here as God's sons and heirs to labor with him as his sons and him your father You're going up there in this relationship as a part of the mystery of Christ to fulfill the purpose of God in creation. How are you going to labor with him if you don't know him? How are you going to labor with him if you don't understand him? 
This is why Paul tells you, he says, Ephesians 5, there's a lot of deep doctrine in Ephesians when he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time for the days of evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know what that means? It means you don't know how to not waste time unless you understand the will of the Lord. Your days are going to be full of wasted, idle time because you simply do not understand the will of the Lord. Y'all with me? Y'all follow that? I hope. I'm talking real stuff up here. Well, preacher, you don't waste time? Absolutely, I waste time. You know why? Because I'm a fool. So you don't get your feelings hurt all the time, people. I'm a fool. I do not know how to use my time wisely. But I also understand my calling. And I know what I, when, when Paul comes to Philippians and he starts telling you how to walk like him, in order for you to understand what Paul's talking about in Philippians, you have to understand this information in Ephesians. Amen? I mean, let, let me, let, look, at, look at verse 15. I ain't going to keep you guys too much longer here. Even, even, even though it's going to anger the brethren, man, you've received the adoption of sons to labor with the Father in his will and purpose for creation. Amen? In fact, let me read you something here. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That ain't just today. When was the will and purpose of God planned and purposed, guys? And you know what God is doing in you? He's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring that you may be harmless and blameless, the what? Sons of God. Y'all, listen, man, we're, we're on something here. And it ain't, <laughs> I ain't going to go there. <laughs> You are God's workmanship, created in Christ under these good works. And so guess what? You as a son should know the will of God like no other creature in heaven and earth. You know, you know who the principalities and powers are learning the manifold wisdom of God from? The church. That means... Up here in the heavenly places are principalities and powers in the heavenly realm that are now learning by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Okay? You know what creation's waiting for? The manifestation of the sons of God. Creation has a hope. It's out here in the future. There's a hope for creation. But what it's waiting for is the manifestation of these sons that are being called out at this day of redemption. Amen. All right. Ephesians 1, 17, Paul says, this is why the reason I point this out is that you as a son in this thing you as an heir in this thing should understand the will of God. You should know the will of God. And this is Paul's prayer. He gave you this knowledge here and now he's praying is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ would give unto you, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. <clears throat> now what Paul, wants, what Paul wants here is for you to simply understand what God has planned and purpose for creation. So that you could know some things about your own calling and all this stuff. But here's, here, here's where I want to spend just a few moments before I close. 
What is a spirit of wisdom of, of, and rev, a spirit of wisdom and revelation? Do y'all ever consider stuff like that, or are you just breezing through the Bible? Y'all ever read Hebrews 4:12? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing even to the dividing. You find me a surgeon in America that can get that fine and get that deep into a man's being. I can crack that skull open, man, and look at the brain and everything else. You find me some, you find me any other person or any instrument in this world so fine and so sharp that it can cut to the, and pierce even to the dividing asunder of what? Soul and spirit. Y'all, you ever consider a passage like that? It blows my mind. You ever, you ever consider the fact that all your problem may be from not knowing the difference between your heart and your mind? Have you ever considered it? Have you ever considered the fact that you may be walking day by day according to your emotions and how you feel. And yet you're unstable because the heart is blind because of a darkened understanding. You ever consider it? If man has a mind and a heart. If man has a mind and a heart. And you're, you're over here, you're over here, and you're just, well, I feel this way today, but now I don't feel like that anymore. And now I feel this way today. And you, know what that, you know what we call that? We call that unstable. Amen? Why is the heart, why is the, why is the emotions of man so messed up? I face them too. But why is man's emotion so out of whack? Because his heart is blind. But why is his heart blind? Darkened understanding. Why is the understanding darkened? Vanity of the mind. Amen? That's how Satan darkens man's inner man is by filling your mind with vanity. What's he trying to keep hid from you? This stuff right here. Amen. Jesus Christ is up here, boys. Guess who's under his feet? You think Satan wants you to know and you? Amen. Amen. And what you're going to have to understand is how this, this is going to work in you. Because man is. And I, you know, when we start talking about this stuff, man, people don't like talking about it. They don't like talking about it. Because, because it's deep. This stuff is deep when you start talking about the mind and the heart and the body and the soul and the spirit. It gets deep. But have y'all ever wondered why David said, <clears throat> Oh my soul, why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. What is he, a schizo? Ever wondered why Paul said, The good that I would, I do not? I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but there's an outward man also. When David is saying, O oh my soul, why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God. That's David's spirit pleading with his soul. And you're going to have to understand this stuff because your soul is going to doubt. It's going to fear. It's going to be up and down. And the only way to get this in check is there. 
Amen. There is a, you ever wonder why Paul said that God would give you a spirit? Come up here and ask him for it. See if you get it. Why does Paul say spirit? That God would give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Job 32 and 8 says there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. What was given by inspiration of God? All scriptures given by inspiration of God. So when Paul's talking about a spirit of wisdom and revelation, he's talking about your spirit that has been instructed and taught by the inspiration of Almighty God. Where does that come from? The scriptures. The book was given to you to teach and to communicate to your spirit the things of God. Now, look at Ephesians 4, 17. Until the word of God enlightens the understanding, you know what your heart is? Until God's word gets in here, this is what you're going to have to understand. God does not communicate to your heart directly. Does, is there a mediator or isn't there, guys? Let's quit acting like this thing is not functional. It's just something we dream up and conjure up. Is there a mediator or isn't there? God does not communicate directly to the heart. He come down on Mount Sinai, Moses, let us never hear that voice again. Amen. God does not communicate directly to your heart. You know what would happen to your heart if God come in there and started trying to talk to that heart and teach that heart? Your heart would fail. So what does God do? His spirit communicates to the mind and guess what this spirit is doing in your mind? What's the mind of Christ do? That Christ may dwell where? God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your... How does he do that? The Spirit of God, when He's speaking to the mind, He's developing the mind of a son in you. And when you receive this mind of Christ, you can begin to communicate to the heart. And the heart, guess what's going to happen now? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Those unstable emotions that's just all over the place. Because of the blindness of your heart, the moment that light starts coming into the heart, joy and peace and love and meekness and long-suffering begins to root itself in the heart of man. There's no more of this, I hope I get there. There's joy, thanksgiving. The heart of man begins to cry out because it's been enlightened by this spirit here. And so when we talk about a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, this is what Paul's talking about. The Gentile world, the way you were as a Gentile, what was your mind? It was in vanity. Right? What was your heart? Blindness. But why was your heart blind? What, does, what do you have to have to be able to see? Forget about, forget, you, you can blind a man in one of two ways. Knock his eyeballs out, which are the receivers, or turn the lights off. I had functional eyeballs in the coal mines. When you turned the lights out, you couldn't see two, two inches in front of you. And so the reason, what we have to ask here, is why is the heart blind? Well, he tells you why the heart is blind. Their understanding is what? Darkened. And this darkened understanding alienates 
this man from the wife of who? God. <laughs> Through what? Ignorance. So what, are, what, are, what is Paul doing here in Ephesians then? He's curing this. But where is it going to start? You have to get rid of that vanity that's in the mind. How are you going to do that? Understanding the purpose for why you're here. And through that mind being educated as a son in the mind of Christ, the understanding goes from being darkened to enlightened. That enlightened understanding removes this blindness of the heart and guess what begins to flood the heart of man? The life of God. Amen. You think Freud understood it? Nietzsche, Descartes, and guys, man, you, I'd give them a nickel for their faults. That's about it. The Apostle Paul's writing about psychology and the workings of an inner man that you've never heard of before. And the Freudian psychologists and the, and the, the modern, modern psychiatry and all this stuff, they know nothing about this stuff right here. Amen? And so when, when you start, when, when we, as we get into this now, the way this is going to operate, as Paul talks about understanding enlightened, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who? So where does it begin? Knowledge of him. If you don't take in the knowledge, you can forget about having a spirit of wisdom and revelation. We take in the knowledge into our mind. It's the spirit of God. And we take that knowledge into our mind. And as the Spirit of God begins to work in the mind, teaching us this knowledge, our spirit becomes a spirit of wisdom and revelation in that knowledge. We don't just know that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We have wisdom and revelation in that knowledge. Right? We can sit and read Ephesians 1, 4, guys. This mystery of God the Father and the Son, that's real. You say, where'd you... How'd you learn that? How'd you learn that? Exactly the way I'm telling you right now. You take in the knowledge and the Spirit of God begins to give wisdom and revelation in the spirit and mind of man. And that, that wisdom of, and revelation in this knowledge is going to open up the eyes of our understanding. Meaning, the eyes of our understanding are looking towards the Spirit. They're focused on the Spirit. We were created to function this way. Meaning in our inner man is these, this understanding that's a part of our being that's looking this way. And it's looking for this revelation in the Spirit. The Spirit of God teaching us, illuminating our minds. And as that light out of our mind comes this way, the heart begins to receive the understanding of the Word of God. You feel it? You, you got it? This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And you know what that understanding is going to do? It's going to lead to chapter 3. And I, I'm, I, you don't have to flip there. It's going to lead to chapter 3. It's going to lead to the indwelling of Christ in your heart. Walking and functioning as a son that understands his purpose and will of his calling. And he's going to begin to walk worthy, not just to the Father, walk worthy with each other. We are members one of another. There's one spirit, one body in this thing. And as we all grow up in Christ, Bill, it's why I teach you guys this stuff. Amen? Because whether y'all know it or not, man, in four years we're growing Closer and closer and closer together. Through the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God's Son. Amen. We're being fitly joined together by one spirit. Amen. And compacted by what every joint supplies. Amen. Amen. 
And it's all for the purpose, man, this working of the Spirit of God in all of us as members of His body. One of these days we're all being called up to go up there and function in that unity of the Spirit. As God's sons and heirs. And man, I... We'll, we'll look at it next week, man. I, I, I would love to keep teaching, guys. I really would. But this, this enlightened understanding is going, to tell, is going to teach your heart three things. It's about a hope, glory, and power. And, we're, and, and it's, all, it's all taught to you through this knowledge here. And so this information back here, Paul's prayer concerning this information is that your, your spirit would be, would have wisdom and revelation in this knowledge, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Meaning, everything you need to know those three things, we're back here in this knowledge. And so we go back and we'll start looking. Well, what is the hope of his calling? What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance? What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? Amen. All right. Any questions on this? That's what we'll get into next week is knowing those three things. I'm telling you guys, when this heart gets the hope and starts seeing the riches of the glory... Remember when Paul said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man? When this heart starts seeing the hope and the glory and the power, they ain't a thing this world can do with you. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Amen. And that's what you're getting. So that enlightened understanding is that power. Amen. And we're not talking about a power that can move mountains. We're talking about a power that can do all things and be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Because of the hope and the glory that you know is coming. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this day, Lord. I pray that this message would... would uh, we go out and do what it was given to us in your epistles to do, Father. We know that we are these epistles and that these things are to be written in our hearts and that we are to, to understand these things and to, and to receive them by faith so that your spirit can, can do its work in our inner man. And, and, Father, we just pray that you would give understanding to each and every one of us here concerning this stuff about the mind and the heart, Father. Help us to be able to discern those, those things in our lives, Father, and not to, not to trust in our, in our heart and our emotions, Father, and the instability of that, that part of our being, Father, but help us to discern the spirit, the spirit that you've given us, that, that part of us that that's, that's, has the knowledge and the faith and pleads with that other part of our being to, 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 to listen and to believe and to trust and obey. God, just, just help us to understand those things and how they're working in us to, to form Christ in our inner man, to, to, to move into our heart and to, to guide us through his life. And God, I ask that you keep everybody safe, keep me safe as I travel to Grantsville. And we just ask it all in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.